Binda again. Welcome to Nongong, where we explore what it means to be Indigenous today in the nation's capital on traditional Algonquin territory. Even though many Indigenous people are reclaiming their identity and their rights, there is still a very vulnerable and severely ignored part of our communities, our homeless brothers and sisters. Let's hit the town. During the last census collection in 2011, it was reported that 56% of the Indigenous population in Canada lived in urban centres. Indigenous people often move to urban centres for opportunities that are not offered in their communities. However, it is not easy to relocate. According to research done by Belanger et al. in 2013, one in 15 Indigenous people in urban centers experience homelessness, compared to one in 128 in the general population. This means Indigenous people are eight times more likely to experience homelessness. My name is Kevin Schofield. I'm from Northern Canada, and I've been living in uh, Ottawa for a good many years. I kind of grew up here, I spent, started coming here as a teenager. I was working and had money and ordinary person for many, many, many years. And then I ended up getting sick and my, my life just fell apart. And I ended up being homeless. So it could happen to anybody. It could happen to me. It could happen to anybody. But I know that I'm gonna let me, even though you try to kill me. I'm gonna live. So uh, thanks so much for coming here today and Thank talking you. with me. Pleasure um, to be here. <laughs> um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, your story? It's been. Um, I have to have two personas, like the, the real me and then the homeless me. And you have to, it's a facade that you keep in front of you to protect yourself. And you, you have to be more gritty, more aware all the time. And I tend, how I do it is I be alone. I ended up being, I end up being alone most of the days so just to survive, and just to, to enable to have a simpler day. <laughs> you just be by yourself. And then I go out, and then. I go out into the city or go see my friends that have real lives or ordinary lives and then I retreat at night to go eat in the, at the missions and sleep at night when I'm exhausted. So I, just, I stay out of the system as long as I can. I just go home and sleep at night and then wake up in the morning and leave. So it's mostly, it's been this way for about a little under two months now. You've had a little bit of experience yep. on the streets yep. prior to that. Um, could you tell me a little bit about some of those experiences? Like, I remember um, hearing some pretty hard stories about territory. Yeah. And, and people don't think about when you're in poverty or homeless, you have to protect your own territory. Yeah. It's kind of unnecessary, but that's just the way it is. And I guess people on the streets, uh, it's dominated by a lot of jailhouse culture. So a lot of jailhouse culture uh, is, is aggressive and, and, and they have all kinds of codes and rules and you have to defend your territory. And unfortunately, that's the case in the city, on the streets. And a lot of our people have never been to jail, so they're innocent to that. And there's a lot of ways we can um, break some kind of rule that we don't even know about, and we get in trouble because of that. So for me, I just mind my own business, and I don't really bother with people. I don't have friends or anything like that while I'm on the streets. My friends and acquaintances and colleagues are not on the streets. Mm -hmm. So I go out and exist with them, and then go back and when I'm going back I have to change I have to have that facade on the hardcore kind of mean you know snarl 
And I'm not even that way, you know? I don't, like once or twice a week I have to, you know, get kind of rough and kind of, you know, like that. And I'm not even that way. So it's kind of disheartening to have to do that. But you have to. So there's homelessness. Yep. And then there's Aboriginal folk that are homeless. Yep. So could you tell me a little bit about how marginalized it gets and how isolated that issue gets? Well, it's rough in the city because when a Native American is in a vulnerable position or seems needy, it creates a sense of revulsion in Canadians. And that's why we're so uh, on the margins because we're so degraded, treated like we don't matter every day. And even if you're well off, even if you're wearing a suit, even if you have thousands and thousands of dollars in your pocket, you're, you're trying to get a fancy table in a restaurant or like it does, you get treated like, we all get treated consistently the same, whether or not you have money or whether or not you're poor. In Ottawa, anyways, Ottawa is a cold-hearted place, man. Because it has this, everything, they think we have everything for free. So when they see a Native person in want or in need or vulnerable, why should you suffer? You get everything for free, which is a myth. We don't get nothing for free. I mean, I've never got nothing for free in my life. I paid my taxes and I paid my education. Nothing free. It's all a lie. So why do we revolt, we revolt people who to arrive in America? Why do, we, why do they find us so revolting? And uh, that's something that we had to, to, we have to address as a country, because that that spark that exists in the human body of revulsion, that allows people, ordinary Canadians, to be indifferent. Who cares? Phew, they're gross, anyways. Let them die, and then it causes malicious and evil and wicked human beings to create the spark of murder and violence. We're so vulnerable. We can't sleep outside. It's, this is not like uh, hunting. Well, up north, when we sleep outside, maybe a polar bear or some wolves will get you. You sleep outside here, someone's going to kill you. you know, it could happen. For some reason, they see us and they don't, they don't respect our vulnerability. Because that was... There is an Indigenous drop-in centre for homeless people in Ottawa. It's called Shewen Geogamic, which means House of Compassion in Anishinaabe Moen. But most people refer to the centre as 510 or 510 Rideau. So the building was purchased in 2004, and it actually opened February 1st, 2006. And so what was the delay about? The delay was, um, there's a group in Sandy Hill called NIMBY, not in my backyard, and we had to go for a rezoning through City Hall, and they were fighting it. And the day we were to meet with the Ontario Municipal Board, they sent us a letter saying they weren't going to fight it anymore. So why is it so important for Aboriginal homeless people to have a centre like this? because we provide culturally appropriate services. Uh, they're here with their own people and there's a lot of peer support. And if they want to get off the street, they come here other than like when it was closed for two months, they had no place to go. There's a lot of the mainstream organizations, but they, st they say there's still a lot of racism there and they don't feel welcome. So here they're among their own people and it's like um, a home away from home. I've been here uh, 15 years now. So you said you're originally from Cape Dorset yes. in Nunavut. Yes. Uh, the reason I'm in Ottawa is because I require hemodialysis and they don't have that machine where I'm from. So that's why I'm in Ottawa. Uh, the reasons are I come to 510 Rito is for uh, culture my culture, uh, my people come here, Inish people come here, and I get to meet elders from my area, they come here too. A lot of uh, speakers come here, or storytellers, uh, or sometimes uh, we do arts and crafts, or just to play board games like Crib or Super Scrabble or card games. Uh, mainly to uh, see my people, I come here. 
pretty much every day, every day that it's open anyway, Monday to Friday. Can you talk a little bit about programming that's offered here at the Centre? Well, some of the programming we started off is um, over the years there hasn't been a lot of um, we'll say specialized programming for the males. So now we have a men's support group and we have a partnership with a counselor that's paid through Health Canada. So he's, he's there with the group. It runs every Monday night from six to eight. So we have the counselor there and an elder. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a women's support group that's starting up on November 20th. And we, have, we used to have an AA meeting every Wednesday night, but that didn't work out for the homeless clients. So now we have a peer support group, which replaces the AA meeting, and that takes place every Friday. Uh, we have a lot of uh, part, new partners. We have one from uh, the Geriatric Psychiatric uh, Committee, and she'll be coming in, and she's going to talk a lot about uh, the relationship between... Um, uh, drugs and how it affects your brain and dementia and stuff like that because a lot of the clients here are older uh, Most of them are in their 40s now. We do have some youth, but the majority is over 40 um, We're doing housing searches. Uh, we still have the laundry and showers uh, They still have computer access where they can talk to their family on Facebook and we also have the counsel counselor that does one-on-one -on -one counseling for mental health, crisis, residential school, trauma. So it's a lot of new programming. Since 510 has opened its doors, what do you see the community gaining from it? Well, it depends which community you're uh, talking about. Are we talking the Aboriginal community or the homeless community? Because for the homeless community, um, uh, they're gaining a lot back. They're gaining their, um, their heritage. Um, they're finding out who they are, you know, where they come from, uh, they're learning their culture. Um, and then from there, they're able to go back into the main Aboriginal community and participate as an Aboriginal person. So what about the Aboriginal community? What do you see them gaining from the center? Well, I think they're gaining from their family members actually um, going through a healing process, we'll say. Um, they have to, you know, coming from, we'll say, the bottom and working their way up and then getting their family back into the Aboriginal community where they're able to participate like everybody else. So can you tell me a little bit about some of the success stories? Um, well, like I said, the homeless, when you're talking homeless, success stories are not the same as other people. So it's, uh, we had one person that was adopted. She was able to find her, um, her real family and she moved back home. Uh, we did have some people that have, a lot of people that actually that have gone through treatment um, and just coming to 510, they were able to stay off the street, um, you know, long enough to get back on their feet, uh, find a job temporarily or even casual and then get their own housing and keep it. Well, it's very important that we have a senators, sen senators such as uh, 510, 510 available for our people in Ottawa because a lot of the people don't have the street sense to go to the other shelters and they're very vulnerable and they'll get picked on and they don't know the, ro they don't know the ropes yet, the delicate uh, dance you must do when you're on the vulnerable on the streets. A few of my friends, after uh, get, receiving help at 510, they, they got focused and they got the direction they need and they did find housing and I see a lot of people with pride I know it gives us a sense of prov uh, providing safety. To be a, in a place where we get culturally specific uh, outreach workers and services available for, for our First Nations people who are on the streets, who likely won't ask, who won't, likely won't approach a non-native person for help anyways, we, we need something like that. Any kind of compassion or a center of compassion for our people is good. Like our people are murdered and killed at such a high rate, like why, why? What did we ever do? It's for some reason they think of us as indisposable and SOP 510 goes against that. It makes us realize we're not disposable, we're important people. We're worthy of respect and dignity. For someone suffering from poverty or addictions, one day can be a matter of life or death. 
In 2015, the city of Ottawa announced they would no longer fund 510 Rideau. That's a hopeless feeling, you know? When you try to go someplace where you think it's open and it's closed, and it's closed because of funding, oh, it's like the most devastating blow to your heart. You know, once you realize, oh my goodness, I don't even have one single friend, not even this building now. So it's just heartbreaking to go through that. And it's inhumane over dollars and cents. During the three months that 510 was closed, many clients suffered and they were forced to go back to the beginning of their healing due to a change in funding dollars and an oversight by political leaders and administration. So have you noticed any changes in the community since 510 was closed for those couple of months? Yeah, a lot more vulnerable people walking around, a lot more sadness. A lot of them have gone back to drinking, ended up in jail, losing their housing. Um, you were actually with us on April 1st when we saw the woman passed out on the sidewalk. And there's some people that, you know, just a group of them got together, they got housing together, and then they just couldn't live with each other and they just walked away. So they ended up back in the shelter. So we face this real danger and they're going to remove a facility like 510 who keeps people alive, who allow us to get together and keep an eye on each other when we know what's up. We know if someone's sleeping outside. We know if somebody hasn't been seen in a few days. We know if somebody's not taking his meds. We know if somebody's not sleeping properly. We know if somebody's been taking too much dope lately. You know, like, we know all that when we're in a, in a community setting. So we need to have a community, and 510 is that community. After being closed for over three months, 510 was able to reopen due to the donations from the community and a rights relations group. Well, the funding that we have now was designated for the Bannock bus. And because there is no more van, um, there's funding for a full-time person and one part-time person. So the two of us are here and we're doing the programming out of 510. So what about the volunteers and the, the funds for food? Um, after, well, even before 510 closed, um, there was two emergency community meetings. And out of those meetings, uh, we ended up with some grassroots people that wanted to help to keep 510 open. So there was a lot of fundraising. Uh, we had a rally in March. And out of all that, we ended up with um, a partnership with the Rights Relations Network, which is mostly community people. Uh, from churches and you know just ordinary people that got together and started donating money to 510 for food so right now we're open for the clients from 8 to 1 and we serve breakfast and lunch out of the funding that was received and we're able to provide meals up to the end of March. So uh, what would you like to see happen for 510 in the future? Well I'd like to see 510 with more funding um, <clears throat> and possibly a bigger building because this is just too small. And we definitely need more workers because the volume we're getting right now and it is getting colder, I mean, we're stretched to the limit. And the volunteers, I mean, are just serving the food right now, cleaning the center after the meals. So we need peop more people to do hands-on with them. Mm -hmm. We do have partnerships that are coming in, but it's when they're not here that we need the help. I don't even access the services at 510 because I feel bad because I know that they, they're, they're vulnerable and they lack uh, resources and, and I don't want to take the meals there that could go to other people. So because of the lack of funds, guys like me who are able to go to other services because we don't want to take up all the services at 510. What would your recommendations be to just ordinary people living in Ottawa? How can they um, support people that are in these rough situations and the center itself? Well, we're still collecting donations if anybody's interested. I mean, right now we have money till the end of March. Uh, we do get calls once in a while of people that still want to donate. Um, and with the volume, like, the money has to be spread out. 
So do you have any solutions on how we might be able to end homelessness? <laughs> I don't know. Will we ever end homelessness? To begin with, I think it needs to start on the reserves. I mean, you know, if you have family that are in need, then help them. Mm -hmm. You know, make sure that there's resources around there because a lot of the people that are in Ottawa are from the reserves. I mean, when I was young, my dad, we used to have a veteran that lived outside on the reserve and my dad used to go around feeding him. He'd drive around in the car looking for him and he'd bring him food. And I mean, homelessness has been around for years. Are we ever actually gonna get rid of it? It's, it, all it takes is one little thing to happen in somebody's life, and then they're gone. Cause I was born free by a river and I've lived. Well, when, how we can end our poverty solutions is by using humility. And that's one of the, the seven uh, teachings we have. And when you're humble, you're going to want to help other people. It's true that some homeless people would choose that life, and it's a life that they've chosen. But many people, uh, the majority of homeless people, they, would, they need help, and they just fall by the wayside and they end up homeless. And that's where compassion and humility must come in. You know? And it's not a tragic thing, because I'm very grateful to have a bed at the, at the mission. And my friend told me that, oh, it must be so hard for you knowing my, about my former life of uh, prosperity, he said, it must, have been, must be so hard for you to, go, to sleep at the mission. And I said, you're coming from a place of shame. And you don't think about how you bring shame upon your situation. You don't think for a second, oh, I can't believe what has happened to my life. You don't feel sorry. You feel so thankful. At least one organization, one person, one entity in this city cares about me. There is no shame in this. Uh, anybody can become homeless. I'm gonna live. Hey, 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 hey. Homelessness and poverty are a reflection of a society that has forgotten how to care for one another. It is part of many indigenous cultures to constantly give back to your community. When you see your brothers and sisters struggling, think of the generations of trauma that have been passed down due to colonization and assimilation. At any moment, we are just one bad breakup, one accident, one bad day away from using a homeless shelter or using a food bank. We as a society are only as strong as our most hurt people.